Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, so it is five past the hour. Um, we're gonna get started. Just a couple things to mention um, as we get started. First, thank you all for coming to the uh, monthly brigade workshop uh, now now and, and tonight known as the Brigade Project Stand-Up. Um, a couple of things, so it looks like uh, we have a relatively small group today, which is great. We can um, promote folks to be panelists themselves to better facilitate conversation. Um, I will start doing that in a moment. But just a couple of things uh, to note um, about the Code for America Code of Conduct and sort of our, our community norms. So there is a Code of Conduct, which I will type the link to that in the chat in a moment. It's just c4a.me slash coc. Um, the Code of Conduct essentially um, asks everybody to ensure that this is a respectful space for everybody else to um, assume the best and approach people as, uh, as you would like to be approached. Um, and then in terms of community norms, uh, we just ask for folks to um, make sure they are listening as much as they speak and um, being sort of respectful and generous in a more general sense than the, uh, than the code of conduct um, specifies. So um, I think that those are, uh, that's, that's good advice for everyone to follow. Um, another thing that I will note is that we are recording this. We will be posting it to the Code for America YouTube channel. Um, once I promote folks to be panelists, you will be able to share your video if you wish to. Um, but if you don't want to be on the recording, then you uh, certainly don't have to share your video. Um, and of course, if you if you do jump in to, uh, to ask questions, we ask that you uh, do so respectfully. And I, I think we'll do a little bit of question and answer after each of the three presentations, and then we'll have a little bit more of an open discussion afterwards. Um, one last announcement before we uh, open it up to the interesting part that you will actually join for um, is a reminder that the uh, National Advisory Council elections are ongoing. Um, the deadline to register as a candidate is the end of this week or the end of this week as, as defined by the end of your day wherever you are on Sunday the 21st. Um, I encourage you if you have thought about running in the past, if you've thought about getting more involved at a national level in Code for America, uh, please consider running. There's a lot of um, a lot of seats open and um, we're doing a lot of regional representation now. So it's a really great opportunity to connect with other brigades in your region. Um, there's been a lot of uh, information shared about that on the brigade channel on the Code for America Slack. Um, so I am going to post in the chat a link to a Google doc and I would like to try something where I'm gonna to try to take some notes. Um, I will also be uh, facilitating. So if other folks wanna jump in on notes as well, they're welcome to. Um, but anybody who has that link, oh, of course I didn't follow my own advice. So only the panelists have it. There we go. <laughs> Anyone who has that link can access the doc um, and I'll be posting this on Slack so we can hopefully continue the conversation afterwards. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to Harlan, Matt, and Madeline from the Code for Boston Vaccinate MA.com project to introduce themselves. And while I while they do that, I will start promoting folks to panelists. This is the part where I go. Please. All right, great. Thanks, Harlan. Uh, hi, my name's Harlan. I'm here from Code for Boston. Uh, and we're gonna talk to you a little bit tonight about the Vaccinate MA project. Um, I'll let my co-presenters introduce themselves before, real quick, before coming back to take it away. So, Matt. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Zagaya, and uh, I help organize Code for Boston, and I am uh, largely playing a DevOps and technical role on this project, uh, so I'll be excited to fill you in on the fun world of tech and Amazon Web Services, and with that, I will uh, pass it over to Madeline. Hi, um, I am Madeline, and I am the volunteer coordinator and also taking care of the site checking part of the project, which I will explain later. Um, but I do have a technical background, so sometimes I will jump in with pull requests if I see something. Hey, Will, can you let me share my screen? I sure can. Hold on one second. All right, give that a shot. You should be able to share now. I can sure do it. Great. Okay, so let's start with the story. Um, 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we, we how we got here. Can you see uh, Twitter? Is that what you're seeing on the screen right now? Okay. So, uh, vaccines, vaccines in Massachusetts, they are a hot mess. Uh, rolling everything out to sort of everybody in the state. Um, as you can see here, this is from a little bit from a, about a week and a half ago. We're not doing awesome here, um, which I think is sort of especially galling for a place where we basically invented one of the vaccines. I think that feels real bad. Um, we're not doing great. We're really not doing great. Um, the vaccine rollout here has been slow and plagued with um, a bunch of technical problems. So um, at the state level, the finder site for how to find out where to get vaccinated. This is a, a screenshot from um, from mass.gov. It's from the archive.org. It doesn't actually properly capture how bad the state site was for quite a while, but um, it's a lot of text. There's a map that like, I think sometimes worked. I can't tell if this is because of the um, archive.org. But the real problem is that there, there were two main problems. One is that there's no centralized appointment system for making an appointment to get a COVID vaccine. Um, they've routed you all into a third party vendors, each of whom have a different user flow for signing up for a vaccine. And given that situation, they couldn't even provide sort of like availability information on the state website. So they couldn't say that this web, you know, that the, this CVS had 100 available appointments, that Walgreens had 200 available appointments. There was no way to know whether or not you should even go down the path of one of these varied workflows. Um, and so it was sort of a big mess. Uh, this is what it looks like at Walgreens. I'm sure you all have had some flavor of this in your own states. Walgreens has a flow that looks like this. And then whatever this is has a flow that does something else completely different. Um, Prep mod, which the state uses, has a flow that looks like this. And so this is really, really confusing, especially for the first set of people who tend to be uh, in phase one here in Massachusetts who are older, maybe less technically savvy, and we're making a lot of calls to their children and grandchildren to help them out uh, to register for a vaccine. So this was not, oh, and uh, some places there weren't even web links, it was like this. If you can see this on this air table here, the uh, app to book an appointment at the Worcester Allergy and Asthma Care Center, you had to send an email to this address, providing only your first name, number, and preferred location for a vaccination. So it's sort of the application process for getting an appointment is sort of all over the place. Um, and this is really only partially a technology problem, right? Like there was a policy that said, there was an approach to vaccination rollout and a policy that said, we're gonna outsource this to third party vendors. So like in some ways it's understandable and the technology is apologizing for bad policy. But another way is like, there are things you can do to make the website better. Um, things continue to be bad. A um, lot of criticism of the state website, the Salem News saying the state needs help. Um, this state Senator filed emergency legislation to create a centralized online portal for vaccinations. It's been sort of a hot mess. And so we were sitting around here um, at Code for Boston wondering how we could help. And then uh, we saw a tweet about New York's vaccine list, um, this service that sort of went a little bit viral down in New York City. And so I reached out to them to see if we could fork their code and we could hang out. And while we were doing that, um, we got connected to another group of volunteers who was already working on vaccinate MA com um, a, a guy named Zane Stiles who is a, an analyst at Bain started up the site I think Madeline and a couple of other people jumped on really really early and so while we were looking around to figure out how to start up a solution we were like oh hey some people are already doing it that's awesome let's see if we can bring all of the code for Boston sort of business uh, that we usually do to help out with design with technology with hosting 
um, with volunteer support, all the things that we usually do at Code for Boston. And so um, we've been in there uh, working with that team um, for about, I don't know, what has it been, Madeline, like two weeks, something like that, 10 days. It's been a really short and very intense run. Um, and so we're joining a bunch of other sites like uh, the Vaccinate CA team, um, the US Digital Service has a list of all kinds of projects that are doing this sort of work in various states. Um, and so we've been in there working with the team. Um, the brief description with which Matt and Madeline will get into themselves is that mostly there are, we have a bunch of web scrapers that are looking at some of the more common sites, but then also we augment them with a like a small army of volunteers that Madeline has been training and managing who are making manual calls to a bunch of clinics all over the state to update uh, information in our database. Um, it, which is pretty wild. Um, there's been a bunch of other stuff that has happened as well. Uh, we've connected with the state a couple of times. Um, another engineer stood up a site that went viral and she was on CNN and it was a whole thing. Um, we pushed the state to make a better site. Um, this is the new state website on mass.gov. It's got um, a better search, it's got better filtering, it's got better information. All in all, it's better, but they're still plagued by the same lack of, of data that we are or would be absent the volunteer organization. Um, you know, we rolled out this really weird, oh God, stop TurboTax. We rolled out this really weird sort of like probably ill-fated companion program where you can, if you bring, if you escort someone to go get a COVID vaccine, you can get one yourself, which like immediately spawned this whole weird gray market for, you know, like on the spot elder care. It's been like a really weird time here in Massachusetts. And so we're working on vaccinatema.com to try and bring a little bit of clarity to to that process. So um, that's sort of the setup. I'll let Matt take it away to talk about tech before handing it over to Madeline to talk about the volunteer organization. Unless all I missed right. any key parts of the story. Did I get it all? Great. Yeah, uh, that, that looks good to me. Uh, thanks, Harlan. And um, so I will uh, talk about the technology, which is uh, usually the least exciting part of these projects, except uh, for all you nerds out there. Um, I'm sure you are just sort of chomping at the bit to know uh, what we have been doing and how this arrived. And I think that the first thing to understand is with a project like this, um, the technology very much arrives. You don't choose your tech, tech stack, it chooses you. Uh, and so what happened is, is that uh, some folks uh, started on the project and they began with what they knew and what they could find some uh, good documentation and tutorials for. Um, and fortunately, um, it actually wasn't that bad. Uh, they arrived and uh, we had a uh, Express JS application. So it's a, sort of a JavaScript or Node backend, which is, um, I think, good because a lot of folks uh, from coding boot camps and other backgrounds uh, learn JavaScript. And so it's a very accessible language, uh, easy to sort of figure out. And the second thing is that it was being deployed uh, to one of the individual's personal Elastic Beanstalk accounts. Uh, Elastic Beanstalk being a system that uh, the folks at Amazon have devised to sort of set up your website in a way that can handle large loads. So if you, know, you get in the Wall Street Journal and tens of thousands of people show up, it'll just start spinning up servers and be able to handle that sort of thing. Um, so seeing that, um, it was, you know, pretty decently exciting um, to know that we were in a pretty solid place, but uh, we did have to start to move it and create things in a way that folks could better collaborate. 
So the first thing uh, that we had to do is we had to go through the repo. We had to scrub out all the secrets. Uh, a lot of folks uh, don't think about uh, the fact that when you're working on code, there are API keys and passwords and things that can linger in there. Uh, so I went through and did a full scrub through the code base for secrets. Um, it was originally a private bit bucket, uh, moved it over to the code for Boston GitHub, and then used GitHub actions to enable something called continuous deployment. Uh, it was very exciting uh, to have continuous deployment because what it meant is when folks want to update the site, they didn't have to ask me. They don't have to get permission. They can just uh, have some review on GitHub through their pull request. And then once it's merged into the main branch, uh, sets off an action that then puts the latest version of the site on the production. And so that's the one that everyone gets to see. So I think that that was um, very much sort of a worthwhile move there. And then uh, the question sort of comes up, um, where are we going? Uh, what do we have to do? Well, there's a couple things uh, that we're dealing with. I think first and foremost, um, a lot of the site was built uh, off uh, a little Rube Goldberg a system of some Google forms that then triggered an air table that then is uh, scraped on the site. And that sort of uh, system I think is great for rapid prototyping. But uh, we've learned that folks um, can very easily uh, break an Airtable. They could rename the columns. They can add in rows with messy data that the application doesn't expect. Uh, so we're uh, in the process of developing a more formal API connected to a Postgres database. Uh, so then that way we can intake that data and make uh, the site a little more reliable there. And then uh, the other thing we're working on is we're uh, migrating our front end to React. So uh, Harlan's worked on a great new design and we have a whole bunch of designers that are uh, working on some new pages. And it's very exciting to start to see that development. Uh, we have a whole bunch of folks on the tech team, some working on the front end, some working on the API, uh, everyone collaborating in Slack. Um, and then we have a Trello with all the different things to do there. Uh, and then I'll do uh, reviews of things at night. I'd say the only major challenge was, uh, you know, we had uh, some folks uh, overload the site one night. Uh, we weren't sure if it was uh, malicious or not. And we realized uh, we didn't have um, as much logging as we should have. Uh, but fortunately, Code for America has a partnership with New Relic. And so if your uh, brigade has not yet tapped uh, New Relic and the newrelic.org uh, in-kind partnership that Code for America has, uh, we just uh, took advantage of it, uh, integrated it into this application. And now we have a lot more logging and ability to see what happens when that sort of thing occurs. And so uh, I was excited at how well, uh, you know, and how easy that was to do. I think I spent 30 or 45 minutes uh, pulling that in. And now I have a dashboard to keep track of things. Um, so it's really, uh, I think my advice here, um, you know, don't change anything right away. Your instinct might be to come in and be like, this tech stack is all wrong. I'm gonna like mess with everything. Uh, no, keep it the same, move slowly, pick like parts, figure out where you need to go, keep it accessible and take advantage of the resources Code for America gives you both with Amazon Web Services and New Relic uh, because those are great resources and I think uh, really made a difference um, with this. So uh, that's uh, the tech side of things. I will uh, now toss it to probably the most important part or one of the most important parts is uh, the work Madeline's been doing uh, with our volunteers. Thank you. So yeah, I think uh, one time Matt described it as like building an airplane while you're flying it. And that's what it feels like a lot of the time. So we're building a new backend and a design, but we're also like dealing with spikes in traffic as new eligibility phases roll out. Um, so I will share some screen things. Um, so this is like some of the deck that I use to train people. Um, Cause I think it's, I found it's very important to talk to each person that I'm going to have do site checking because they need to be, they need to have some level of independence and tech savviness and like just having a lot of different volunteers who are tapped into a lot of different uh, news sources has been crucial because there's no centralized system for either signups or lists of locations. Um, so like 
we will find out like, oh, there's a, a new location that we have to start tracking that's opening tomorrow. Okay, let's, we found out about that, not from the state website because they don't have it, but like from some news article. So uh, as Harlan mentioned, lots of different systems. There's one which holds about 50% of the availability, but there are that and in that one like is sort of tracked on the state um, sign up website, but then there are a lot of one off systems and then these retail pharmacies which um, are actively changing their flow. We're not sure if they're specifically trying to do a cat and mouse game and like stop both scrapers for availability and people who might try to automate taking those slots and then giving them away or something. So in many cases, it is hard to come up with something to automatically check. Um, and in some cases, it's you know checking a Facebook page to see if the health department has posted more info. So the site checkers, each person has like, Airtable has been great both as a um, ad hoc backend and then as a way of organizing volunteers because I give each person like a view only custom spreadsheet where they are assigned. Um, and each day at whatever time they want, they look at it and they go through. So there are these two columns, um, there's book an appointment, which is like basically the information that um, the state gives for how to find slots. And then methodology is like our own notes of like, okay, um, you should actually check the health department homepage because they're gonna be using like unlisted links or something. Um, and so they do go and they check the availability and then we have like a whole document with a flowchart um, because it's not, we, we've been trying to come up with a, a way of structuring the availability data um, so that it's easier for people to search through it and we can do more sophisticated things. But in many cases, we simply don't have access to that. So we might have an exact number of slots and we might not. We might know when there are gonna be new appointments released, we might not. Um, so we are trying to come up with a standardized way for people to enter that. Uh, so then they enter that, there's a script which takes it from the form, puts it into our Airtable, and then it's live. So yeah, sometimes we mark things as like having availability, even if it means that there's simply a waitlist because we want it to appear. And um, one thing that we have, which isn't found elsewhere, is a lot of this like human intelligence of like, you know what, I noticed the health department is announcing things in advance before it goes live on the state website. So like, we try to give people that information. Um, what else? So I said that talking to people in person was valuable um, because I had them go through a worked example and there were some people that I thought wouldn't actually be suited to the independence of that task. So we redirected them. We have a whole separate effort, effort um, we're doing direct outreach to eligible groups. So we're working with a public health student um, and they are doing great work finding out like, oh, the homeless shelters are finding out that they're eligible. That's great. Let's move on to the next group. So if we have, right now we have about 13 people who do this every day. Um, and then we also have a an Airtable view of like stale sites. So this is like automatically updated if those sites haven't had new data for like two days. Um, and then people understand like if they have extra time and they're feeling motivated, they can go and check the stale things. So if we get more people doing this manual work, um, which we might wanna have so we can have multiple coverage of each site, then I think I'd like to split people into smaller pods where there's a mix of experienced people and new people so that they can, that can be the first line of um, asking questions. Cause I would rather people ask us question that they think is dumb and get an answer rather than enter wrong information. Um, Cause the worst thing for us would be to say that there is no availability when there is, but you just had to look a little harder. Um, and finally, as far as uh, attracting volunteers to the project, I think just the relevance of the topic has brought people to us. Um, we also did actively seek out PR, which has helped both with traffic and getting volunteers interested. And to keep them interested, I find um, sharing feedback with them. Uh, we have a lot, like about two to 300 Google form responses of people who are like, hey, love the site, hate the site, this is what I think you should do next. Um, and sharing when someone's able to get a vaccine successfully really motivates people. Um, and I've heard that 
volunteers feel like it's a tiny thing they can do every day, but it makes a big difference. That's very cool. This is a, this is a great, a great project. I, I am um, curious, Madeline, where, uh, do you have a sense of where the bulk of your volunteers are coming from? Are they just folks that find out and are interested or is there like a specific source that most people are finding out about it? Um, there's been, initially I, there was some word of mouth. Um, I asked some friends, other people asked friends. We've gotten a large influx of volunteers who seem to be like maybe an older crowd who found out about us via news coverage. I'm not sure. I think, yeah, I'm not sure. Cool. Um, one, one more question for me, and I think we, we may have time for a question or two, although I, I'd like to save the majority of them for the end so that our other panelists have a, a moment to, to present as well. But um, for, I, I suppose, Matt or, or Harlan, it sounds to me from a perspective of someone who doesn't understand the technology that there is nothing about the technology that would mean that this is Massachusetts specific. Like this is a thing that you could do in other, in other states, like just using their disparate data sources as well. Is that, is that the right way to think about it? I think yeah. generally Sorry, speaking, I think you'd probably have to redo some of the scrapers depending on what your local providers are doing. But I think that's right. I think Matt, sorry, I jumped you. Oh, no worries. Uh, that, that was um, pretty much where I was aiming is that, um, so for the individual um, sources or scrapers, those are very individualized and those are also brittle systems. Uh, currently folks are running them on their own machines. We're looking into translating them into something called Lambda functions on Amazon and sort of making them a little more robust, but uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the sites are going to potentially deploy countermeasures or they're going to change things. Someone, you know, likes the font to be green tomorrow and suddenly the scraper breaks. So you yeah, do have to keep on top of that automation and that's work and um, different places have different um, sorts of sites. Uh, there is some standardization across vendors. Uh, so a vendor might exist in multiple places and then have a similar site structure you can use. And then finally, uh, yeah, I think everything else um, is, you know, commercially available, uh, inexpensive uh, to procure, at least at the scale we've been using it, um, unless we've been running up a big bill and Will hasn't told us yet, but, uh, you know, keep us posted. <laughs> I'll be sure to do that, but I, I don't have any big surprises waiting in my inbox, so I think we're good for the moment. Um, all right. Uh, if, if anyone has a, a burning question they want to ask now, um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump in. Otherwise, um, I will move us on to hear from Brett. Uh, Brendan, it's, it looked like you might have a question or? No, I got to hop onto oh. another meeting. Thanks for sharing. Oh, and I look forward to watching the video. Sorry. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Um, great. So uh, in the meantime, it looks like a couple of folks um, joined us since I last said this. So. I will just mention that I'll, I'll add those of you who have joined um, as panelists so that you can um, join the conversation. Uh, just, just to note that we are recording this and it'll be on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you don't want your, uh, your video on the YouTube channel, then you're, you're welcome to leave it off. Um, and then also uh, just a, a reminder to be respectful of folks as you, as you interact with them. Um, but Brett, do you want to introduce yourself and walk us through the uh, public utility data project? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Brett Walker. I'm one of the organizers of um, Code for Kentuckiana. Uh, we're in the Louisville sort of metro area, which is right on the border of Kentucky and Southern Indiana, which is where Kentuckiana comes from. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to share a couple of projects um, that we have um, that I think could be reused um, in other cities. And so this one is something that we sort of launched um, at the end of 2019. And it's sort of about collecting uh, power utility data, really outage data. Um, I think M called this out in the brigade channel, just given all of the uh, storm outages that are going on and sort of the, the West and Texas in particular. Um, so what we, we built this um, utility essentially to 
scrape our local um, uh, service providers website and log outages every 30 minutes. And so the sort of aim of this is really to allow people to um, do analysis on it or um, just sort of unlock the data. It's really only available sort of via a, a web map right now. Um, there's no programmatic access or anything like that. And so we wanted to allow people to get access to the raw data um, so that they could build things you know, on top of it or, or do analysis using it. Um, if you look at our sort of uh, public web page, we have sort of a write up about it, sort of the, the reason we did it and some inspiration and then going into some of the technical details. Um, this is also inspired by um, a pg e data scraper that um, someone named, his, his name is Simon Willison uh, wrote. He, uh, he uh, wrote this great little utility called data set that allows you to sort of expose SQLite databases via a, a nice web interface. And so the way that this works um, sort of from a technical level is on uh, a periodic basis, every 30 minutes we go and we scrape the, the data from our uh, power provider's website. And then we log all of the outages uh, in, in like Git. So they each, each sort of chain shows up as a Git commit. And so you can sort of, um, even if you don't want to start running like queries against the database, you can look in the, the Git commit history um, to see sort of the, the change over time. So it, let me show you real quickly what the website looks like. So this is our, our YouTube provider's website. And so you can zoom in and see you know, this is um, a certain number of outages and it tells you information about it, who, how many people are affected. Um, but the, the sort of useful or good thing about this is that, let me reset my screen so I can access the scroll bar. The, the nice thing about this is it actually uses a third party service. And from what I can tell, it's a pretty popular one. So um, I just looked for, so we have code for Boston, I looked for uh, Massachusetts. It looks like it's in use by one of the utilities there. It's also in use in Austin. Um, so we wrote the scraper so that it, it can be just reused, you know, with, with sort of changing a couple of variables, essentially like, you know, the identifiers for the, the provider. Um, and so let me show you a little bit on the, the code side, what happened. So uh, Kubra is the, is the provider. So we wrote something called a Kubra scraper. And then we have a, a separate repo that basically is where the outage data is written to. And let me just start there and show you sort of what that looks like. So you can see there are like 30,000 commits. And so you can see basically, oh, outage, one outage moved, nine outages changed, two outages removed, all of it. So this is, this is just on an ongoing basis. Every 30 minutes, we check outages and write them to, to this um, repo. Um, from there, we have a, a GitHub action that basically then deploys um, this data. It, it pulls it from the Git commits into a, a SQLite format, and then it deploys that to Heroku. And so all of the outage data is made available uh, via data set. And so this is what data set looks like. It's the um, tool I was mentioning before that, that sort of exposes SQLite databases um, via a web interface. And so you can write queries like this that sort of show you over time how many customers were affected. Um, but we have you know, data going back now a couple of years. And so I think this is something that can be really useful over time, um, particularly over time, because you could you know, overlay it with um, maybe income information to see if certain neighborhoods are experiencing longer outages, um, you know, and if there's any correlation to sort of the, the median income there. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle, I think, took some of the, the pg e data that Simon had collected and combined it with wind data. They had, I think, a, a year ago or something, or a couple years ago, a um, major outage caused by some abnormal winds. And so they, uh, San Francisco Chronicle did a really nice sort of write-up and interactive map sort of combining all of that data. So that's sort of what it produces. And then um, this is really out there for anyone to take advantage of. They can download the raw data and, you know, play with it and um, hopefully find some interesting things from it. But if you wanted to deploy this in your um, city, you would actually be sort of focused on this repo, which is the scraper. And so I'm happy to work with anyone to try to um, get this set up. If you, if you see that your city or your utility is using 
app that sort of looks like this. This sort of icon right here from multiple is like the dead giveaway. It's the one um, that's on all their maps. If, you, if you'd like to get this um, up and running, uh, in general, it should be fairly easy. There are really like two, a couple of unique identifiers that we need to find just by sort of looking at the sites. Um, I did try to set this up for Austin earlier tonight just to, to see if everything was still up to date. It does look like there's a slightly newer version um, that, that the Austin utility is using um, that is, is a little different and has slightly different URLs. But I'd be happy to work with anyone if, if your city is um, using like the newer version of Kubra to help you get up and running. But essentially, you we can find the IDs and then you just tell it essentially where to write the data. So um, this is an example for like the Washington DC area. So you can tell it where you want to write it and what file you want to write to, and then it will start um, writing to there. And so um, much like Matt was mentioning, um, we use actions to, to do this. So this is um, how we automate the uh, sort of scraping. So um, in the in this utility, we tell GitHub every 30 minutes, uh, run this little script, and then that script runs and it pulls down the data and writes it to the, to the repo. So um, I'd encourage you to take a look at this, um, this sort of blog post. It has a lot more information um, at, at sort of a higher and lower level, um, but it, it is super useful. So, um, or hopefully is useful. So yeah, definitely reach out if you have any questions or you'd like to get this up and running. Um, I think there's, there's probably some interesting information as we've seen in Texas, um, you know, it, the outages, you know, disproportionately affects certain communities. Um, power is super vital to just everyday life. And it, you know, it's really dangerous if you don't have it. So it's an important thing to track and, um, because there aren't really many data sources for this type of information, I, I think this can be you know, potentially useful. The one caveat with this is obviously we're relying on the, the utility for this as the source of the data. Um, it, so all the, all the caveats that come with that, um, they're sort of self-reporting. And so uh, you'd have to rely on that, but um, hopefully there are, you know, things like the public service commissions who make sure that they're, they're you know, being truthful, but there is that caveat as well. Um, so that's uh, the first project. The second one I wanted to talk about was um, one that we are calling uh, just public comment. Um, we have worked with a, a nonprofit here, um, the Kentucky Equal Justice Center, and they um, essentially um, advocate on behalf of Kentuckians. They, they do a lot of civil rights work. Um, but one of the things they've had to do in the past is collect um, public comments on pending rules. Um, so these can be like regulations or upcoming laws. Um, and the way this sort of works is uh, government agencies post um, sort of uh, requests for comments essentially. And so they say, we're, we're considering doing this thing. Public, tell us what you think. And so lots of nonprofits either try to drive traffic to the site or collect comments on behalf of citizens and then submit this to the site. Um, Kentucky Equal Justice Center, Center did this a few years ago uh, when Kentucky was trying to um, get a waiver essentially to prevent Medicaid expansion in Kentucky. And so uh, they got, I think, tens of thousands of comments and essentially by hand copied them over um, into this site. And so the reason why they don't just say go to, you know, go to this URL and comment on your own is because they want to be a part of the process. They want to help people craft uh, what they're writing. And then they also would like to be able to capture information about the people um, who are engaging on these topics. So if they find people who are you know, very interested in healthcare or Medicare or Medicaid, um, they can essentially start to engage those people um, in the future. There apparently are some, um, oh, not open source, but uh, commercial products that sort of facilitate this, um, but they're they're fairly expensive and uh, they can be cost prohibitive for nonprofits. And so, we wrote this little application. Um, and it actually is up and running, but it essentially allows um, an organization to 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 specify a um, an ID for one of these documents and then set up a little web form. Um, it gives them 
code to embed them as an iframe into their website, but set up a form where they can collect this information and it will automatically submit to regulations.gov or it will soon. So previously, part of the reason that there aren't many of these tools or any of these tools sort of in the open source world is because there has not been an API that allows applications to send data to regulations.gov to post data or comments. Uh, they've just had a read only API. But that's changing with um, the new version that's, that's coming out. Um, well, I guess tomorrow is when it launches. But um, there's a new version of the API that allows uh, applications to, to submit comments um, once they're sort of, they get an API token and, and are approved. And so um, this is an app I think that could be, you know, very useful for um, the, the, our main contact at the Kentucky Legal Justice Center said this is something like any nonprofit could use for sort of his words. Um, but anyone who's engaging with um, getting the public to comment on, um, you know, pending regulations or rules really could potentially use this. And so, um, the idea is that I don't yeah, well, probably shouldn't do a live demo. It won't go well. But essentially, what you can do is add um, a, a document just with its ID, and it gives you the the form um, uh, right you know that you can use to embed it. Either share the link to the form or embed it in your site. And then from there, um, when, whenever anyone submits something, it automatically submits to um, regulations.gov, and then it also stores that. The, the comments and the information about the submitter in a database and allows export of that. So um, we've got a little deploy to Heroku button here. So if you would like to deploy this, just to play around with, you can click this button and it'll deploy to your um, Heroku account. But if you ever, um, if you have any uh, nonprofits that you work with who, who interact with regulations back up or collect public comments, this is something we'd love. Um, for you to use. We're looking for our first use case here. Again, the API is just becoming available tomorrow. So it's not something we've actually been able to use. It's just something we've heard there's a need for. Um, but yeah, that's that's the public comment project. And there's a, you know, a lengthy sort of um, uh, review on the, the GitHub that talks about sort of what we're trying to accomplish here. These are both very cool projects, Brett. And I, I um commend you on how easy you have made it for, for other folks to deploy um, deploy this stuff. I think that that's, uh, that's very cool and very um, good good uh, instincts to do that. Um, I also think that these are uh, both examples of projects that are like very quintessential brigade projects. Um, I'd be super curious to see uh, work that, that you or, or anyone else has done about um, looking at like what communities are most heavily affected by power outages. I, I, I've seen a lot of interesting work um, to do with like uh, public school performance and like that mapped against um, against like demographic data, income data, that kind of thing. And it always has some um, sort of depressing results, uh, but I, I'd be interested to see it on a more like copper wiring infrastructure level. Um, that would be very cool. Um, Go ahead. Let's say, um, I, yeah, I totally agree. We haven't done any um, of our own analysis. We have, I, I did reach out to um, a journalist who's in, like in the tech division at the Washington Post. I think this is uh, something that, that um, news organizations could find particularly useful, like their, especially like their news app teams or whatever, who are sort of the more technical um, folks at those, those newspapers or news outlets. Um, but yeah, like much like the pg e story um, that I link in the, the blog post. But yeah, I think it could be sort of really useful. And so it's something that I'm trying to, I'm, we hope is like easy to get up and running and then we can, you can just sort of leave it running and forget about it. And then um, the data is there for, you know, we now have a few years at this point, so. Great. All right. Um, so last but not least, we'll move on to the Brigade Project Index. Um, I. I think I will just, I, I know there's there's a couple of folks from that team um, here, but I, I will just turn it over to you, Gio, to give us a little backstory on what the project is and, and all the many improvements that you have made over the last couple of months. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Wood, and thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, so from the team, uh, I know there are for sure Chris and Melanie, which are the two main architect, developers and everything uh, on this project. 
Um, let me try to share my screen. Um, so I put some slides together. Uh, I'll, I'll go through them. Um, I think you know it's it's on the point of what we heard for both of the previous uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the with the with the idea and and the the need of the uh, project index. But I heard in the previous presentation always, you know, oh, we found a similar project uh, that we we got some ideas from and and some improvements or. I heard a question on, uh, well, couldn't this project be adapted to another reality, another uh, location? Um, so most of the time, I think we could. Um, from my experience, uh, so for now, I kind of, after six months around Code for America, I kind of didn't join any brigade because I didn't find one locally in New Jersey where I live. Um, and I, so that's one more personal reason why I got involved in this um, brigade project index, uh, not coming from already a, a group. I couldn't easily find the project that I was interested in and that I feel I can contribute. So I said, oh, okay, I found, actually, I think I joined this channel brigade project index to ask uh, which kind of project, you know, based on which technology and, and area of interest there were out there that I can join. And so then I learned that there was this index that was um, already active and that was being worked on. Um, so this is you know, what I will try to talk in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, the team I mentioned, right? So Chris um, Alfano, it's mainly on the, on the crawler, the backend, the index data. And Melanie, it's more of the UI side of the index. And then Bonnie from um, Act4LA uh, has been one of the leader on this project uh, with, I say, you know, vision and management. And, and now maybe it's me or, you know, it, we are uh, in a similar position. And then we have some, you know, brigade support and Mark from Democracy Lab. Um, so um, the challenge that we see is that uh, Code for America, it's a very um, open and vast organization. Uh, there are more than a hundred organizations, mostly are, you know, formally brigades, but other are um, less structured maybe organization with many, several thousands volunteer. Um, I think I know there is a process to purge organization from this large list. I don't know if there is for volunteers. Uh, when I was doing my search where to join, I didn't find the, the list to be um, very well up to date. Uh, and so new volunteers join uh, Code for America every day. And often they don't know how to go and find projects that they are interested by uh, either by their roles, their skill or area of interest. Um, and I, I, I read around, you know, in Slack monitoring different channels that so many times people join with already an idea to do a project or to see a need in, in civic tech, um, but without a good way to check if a similar project is already happening or has been already attempted, um, the risk to start a duplication of effort and start a new project uh, which try to accomplish the same uh, functionality. Um, also, I feel that potential beneficiaries of CFI uh, projects, don't. I don't know how they find our projects um, unless there is a, a functional uh, catalog of, of projects that are easy to search by different criteria. Um, and also, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, from these points, uh, I feel that maybe even Code for America leadership and staff don't have a very clear vision of the projects that are out there, in which status are they, whether they need support from, from the organization or looking for volunteers or funding. So I think all of these 
upon some limitations to the potential of CFA. Um, we could reach more beneficiaries, we can be more productive in, in building um, solutions. Uh, and I think this situation often frustrates uh, volunteers that join, um, happy to, to, to contribute, and then after six months, maybe they disappear because they didn't find uh, a good project. Um, so this is not a problem, a new problem, and it's on, it's not only CFA. Um, especially if we marry the civic tech movement with the open source, uh, I think both for definition are very open and a little unstructured. So uh, I, you know, part of this project was to search uh, who else is doing this uh, catalog of um, open source civic tech projects, and I found um maybe 20 organizations all of them with different approach and different limits so um we won't be the one solving the problem but at least it would be great to have a powerful tool within code for america um so we can showcase uh, uh, the good work that we do um so given that they are open source projects uh it's they don't have a, a, a usually don't have a strong hierarchical leadership, uh, both at the organization like the national organization or international like Code for America, and then even within a brigade. Uh, I think often you know three or four people go and start and do a project. Uh, they don't necessarily get directions or follow uh, guidance from from the leadership. So it's difficult to imagine that the situation will change a lot where people can um, classify and publicize their projects in a standard way. So we assume that this is how it works. And so now we, we want to, to see how we can um, collect data about the projects to, to uh, distribute. So we saw that there are two main approaches. Um, across different organizations. One is an organization that builds their own database, uh, like uh, Democracy Lab does. So if you want to um, show in the Democracy Lab index, you, you fill up a form, you provide some details, and then you are into a database that is very well structured. You can easily search by the criteria that uh, Democracy Lab has set up. Um, then the opposite approach that it said of the project the brigade project index is trying to go out there in the wild and find civic tech open source projects um, in different uh, manner with different criteria, with different uh, starting point um, so the first of these two approach require a lot of um, manual uh, input and update to keep the project up to date um, the second approach uh, brings in a quantity of unstructured data, and that's what we are dealing with in, in the uh, Brigade Project Index. Um, um, and, you know, uh, most of the way, the place where we look for projects information, it's GitHub, because everyone is using GitHub, but we shouldn't discount that there are other uh, repository, public repository that some organization may use. So the project index, it's, it's up and running uh, since a while with this new architecture. I learned that there was a previous architecture, but this is what we are uh, using now. And it runs, you know, multiple times a day, uh, thanks for, to some of the actions and, and, and scheduler by, by Chris and, and the uh, crawler collects these uh, type of, you know, this amount of information data. So uh, we collect about 220 organization of which 134 in the US. Um, we retrieve about 7,000 projects of which 4,300 in the US and uh, about a thousand in the US with changes in the last 12 months. Um, across this, so 
collecting the, the projects, you know, getting the name of the projects and maybe the GitHub um, URL, it's not an issue. Uh, what we find it's challenging is how do you classify and make the uh, projects searchable by, by some solid criteria. So we use, um, mostly we use the GitHub um, topic tags that everyone can set up in their GitHub repository. Um, so analyzing the data that we collect so far across these 7,000 projects, we extract almost uh, 1,400 distinct tags. Um, so that gives you <laughs> the idea of how difficult it's now to classify these 1,400 tags because there is everything in every different format. And um, you know, in some case, even if they use the dash rather than a space or camel case, uh, we don't know, we, we, we just count them <laughs> as distinct. Um, and of these 1400, actually 400, they don't really explain what the project is or it's doing, uh, but they are technologies, locations and organization, things that we really don't care to collect this way because we have this information otherwise. But nevertheless, it comes into this long list uh, that we need to, to clean up. And so of the 4,300 projects in the US, we have about 1,000 tags that we are trying to classify in, in a better way. Um, so this is a very you know, high level uh, uh, architecture of, of the uh, tool. There is the, the scroller that runs on schedule and collect all these data starting from um, the list of organization that comprise in Code for America. Um, then there is the status board. It's the UI uh, part of the tool. Um, it allows for search of the projects uh, by name, description and tags. And also it shows a map of the brigades uh, which then show the projects uh, uh, that that brigade it's, it's working on. And finally, let's say there is the taxonomy, which is uh, one of the focus uh, going forward um, because these couple of tools, they work fine. Now we need a better way to um, categorize and make the project searchable. So the crawler and the status board are fairly robust and stable and they keep running. The taxonomy is one section we are working uh, pretty hard. Um, so for the crawler, there is not an interface, a graphical interface. So those are a couple of screenshots of how we collect all the organization and then the um, projects for each organization. Uh, so here I wouldn't even uh, go to the link to see the source. Um, the status board, uh, so this is the search uh, by um, descriptions and tags. And this is the map. Um, let's see, maybe, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I was thinking maybe I can quickly open that one. And so as you see, you know, by default, it goes in one year uh, change and there are almost a thousand projects in the US. Uh, you can filter on the name, uh, descriptions or brigade. Uh, and then here it's where, you know, you will see that the taxonomy, it's not there yet. Uh, see, as soon as you type something, we have a powerful filter and, and retrieval of tags, but this is a little overwhelming, right? It's okay that I typed only E, so, um, if I type education, you know, it should already come down to much less. And but uh, we would like a, a more uh, a powerful um, way to display and search and filter the, the projects. So there it's where the taxonomy comes in. Uh, can you still see everything? I hope. Okay. So this taxonomy, it, it's the challenging module. Uh, uh, I, I see in, in GitHub, uh, there has already been some, some false starts. Um, so as I said, 
many many organizations are trying to use the taxonomy uh, however you know to be functional it need to be flexible extensible um, will we would like to have a ui uh, to view and manage just the taxonomy so maybe uh, the ability to move tags in different categories um, but mostly it's a matter of organization and kind of discipline on the project leaders and organization leader uh, we will you know try to come up with a clear uh, taxonomy in at least a couple of ways that can be used uh, to be effective we will need the projects and the organization leaders to to use it uh, you can still type by hand uh, the tags but if people will use standard uh, common tags it will make the index much more powerful um, i just wanted to mention you know that um, even within code for america there is another project that started with the same uh, purpose the civic tech index uh, from mostly ac for la um, which has a mix approach it will do search github but by some uh, looking for some specific tags and then democracy lab that i explained before how it works and democracy lab i think has only a couple of dozens or maybe 40 or so projects uh, in their database because they need to be entered manually um, an interesting tool that we'll try to um, finalize and not really integrate, but propose to use is this public code, YAML. Uh, so the, the end product, it's this public code.yaml file, which uh, if, if a project decide to use it, it will, it will need to stay in, in the root or in their repository. Uh, there is a user interface that has been built and that I'm looking into um, tweak and, and, and customize. Um, and it's, it's becoming a, an international standard to uh, describe uh, and, and, and classify um, civic tech projects. It's used a lot in Europe uh, by government and, and non-profit organization. So, the UI will assist and drive, you know, a project lead or organization to uh, provide the description, the tags, and um, many information about the project. Some information will be mandatory, some don't need to be mandatory, or some will, will have a list of um, items to pick. So, for example, about the tag, right? The tags, usually what we would like to see, it's a tag that says, you know, this is for agriculture or it's for food distribution or it's for uh, monitoring you know power outage or covid vaccine um, right now you know a lot of people maybe put tags but it's whatever they come up with that day instead we would like to drive this process so that people can choose a tag that we know to search for um, so we will see, you know, as soon as possible, if we can roll out this public code and then uh, suggest projects, leader and organization to um, to use it. To me, um, you know, one of the, the paramount goal of all doing all of these, it's also uh, for a better uh, matchmaking making process. Uh, and I meant with that, uh, the match of volunteers with, with projects. So, Again, I think you know volunteers have hard time to find projects to be productive with. Uh, project seems to have difficulties, challenges often to find uh, productive volunteers. Uh, that seems to lead to some frustration on both sides. Uh, I heard of projects that they say, well, we don't have time to spend to do onboarding, given that then we'll fail in the long term um, and and then you know i go I, I go ahead and you know it's not only uh, matching volunteers and projects but also uh, i've been in software development for 30 or plus years so i'm a, a, a strong fan of 
repeatability and extensibility of, of software. Um, I really don't, I'm, I'm not happy when I see uh, a project replicated six times because it's providing information of six different states. But if the information is the same, uh, we should try to architect it. Uh, whereas the data change, but the, the uh, uh, subsequent layer towards the user don't need to change. And I think that also, I hope it can be improved uh, with a more easily way to search and find similar projects. So before someone started similar projects in another state or another town or another congressman, maybe can figure out that there is already a very similar project and uh, should be enough to extend it. Um, and so those are, you know, the things that I say in these last two or three slides. Uh, more, more specifically, so we'll have the crawler probably collect some more additional data, I include the public code YAML as a source of project information. Uh, we need to finalize this conceptual taxonomy. We are thinking to use uh, a relational database um, to manage the taxonomy so that we can run a bunch of statistics of how many tags are in which area have been created in which period. Um, we can see how Code for America has responded to crisis uh, on different time. Uh, we think we can notify projects that I have tags that are not in the taxonomy. Once we define and finalize the taxonomy, it seems there could be a way to notify the projects if they don't use proper tags. Use this public code, produce statistics, as I said. Um, and then in longer term, you know, we hope this tool will improve the uh, onboarding process and provide uh, statistics and uh, a better view of the awesome work that we all do. Um, and then I think I keep repeating myself, so I'll just jump to to this one. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of people here. A lot of people here are already super busy with their projects or in Code for America organization. Uh, but if you know anyone interested in, in helping us with the project index here, there are some uh, information. I will stop here. This is very cool, Gia. Um, congratulations to you and, and to the other folks on the call who've been working so hard on this. It's uh, I, I I like what you what you said about the sort of your goal around matchmaking and how like finding the right project that uses the skills and like has a place for you is is really really key to uh, people like joining a Code for America brigade or just joining Code for America in general and like being happy. With their with their decision and sticking around and, and finding meaning and meaning in it, um, so that that is uh, that is very cool to uh, to be supporting that. Um, well, that is our last uh, our last presentation. Um, we uh, this this is scheduled for ninety minutes, so we still have another fifteen if we want to stick around and ask some questions, chat about this stuff. Um, I will uh, I, I will open it up to questions from anybody here. Um, who has them? Anyone want to jump in with a question? Like any good moderator, I can continue to ask a couple questions <laughs> as well if, uh, if folks don't have questions to ask. Um, I've actually got one. Um, yeah. For the Airtable flows, I, I don't know much about Airtable. Um, are those able to be, be reused in any way, um, either the templates or are there workflows that sort of, I saw that you copied from one to another, I think. Um, is that um, anything that can be reused? Um, so Airtable has like views. Um... I'm not sure if you can share like what a, a view is across bases. Um, it's not it's not hard to set up. You just like click a few buttons and it, you can set up filtering or sorting or something. Um, as far as the script, the script is actually using the Airtable API and it's not like an Airtable thing. Um, 
but it should be relatively portable, I think. Okay, cool. Just curious. Thanks. Sorry, I just wanted to add that I've been a little rude and since, you know, I see Chris and Melanie of the team, uh, if they have anything to add to my random, well, you know, presentation, feel free. I have nothing to add. I think you did a beautiful job presenting it and I have a much more uh, complete and holistic view. I'll, I'll just I, I guess I, I mentioned in the chat, but if anyone's interested in coming and joining the effort to work on the status board, um, uh, right now that particular part of the project really could use some help from people who are uh, specialized in React, Node, um, or research or design. Um, but if you don't specialize in those things, but want help anyway, uh, we would also welcome your contribution. Um, yeah, one thing I would add is, you know, we we never envisioned this as a grand one end all be all solution to indexing the network. Um, the crawler is designed to, it loads all the data it finds into a GitHub repository. So not only are we capturing all projects across the network, but we're versioning it hour by hour. So, um, you know, we have a rich data set that you can pull and use in your own project, um, not just the status board. Um, and you can, uh, in that data set, you can see all the projects in the network and not just that, but you can also potentially build projects that look at the history of of how the, the network's been evolving. That's cool. That's a, that's a great addition to it, to be able to look at that sort of historical data and, and how, how trends have changed. Um, do you have, uh, can you share anything about like usage and how, uh, how much traffic the, the project index gets? I think we uh, had a debate about whether we wanted to uh, install Google Analytics or not, and then we never did. So, um, TBD. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I, I, as one um, very small data point, I, I used it today. I was looking, um, I was looking for uh, projects that use Mapbox, and I just typed in Map into uh, into the project index and, and found some good uh, some good resources. Um, so very, very I'm a big believer that you know even, even if you don't find a project that you can fork, uh, you know it's always worth at least seeing what people have done already and you, there's at least something to learn from looking through the prior art if, if not finding you know a ready-made redeployable project. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions from folks? And perhaps a self-serving question. Uh, I work alongside Will and, and others on the network team. And I'm curious what support any of you who presented or anyone else in the call um, could use um, your project. So maybe that includes more in-kind resources, um, other resources that you could think of, publicity, um, whatever comes to mind would be curious. What, um, if you could wave a magic wand, what, what would additional support look like? Uh, from my experience, I would say um, I would like to see more sharing of resources, whether it is knowledge or um, skills. And um, like I've been also a little surprised to see that um, the environments where we deploy uh, the projects it seems that a lot of times are personal accounts. Um, and then sometimes it, you lose track of who owns that uh, account <laughs> where the application was deployed uh, 16 months ago. And now there is a problem and nobody has access to it. Um, so I think, I mean, I'm a fan in general of standardization and, and you know, scale uh, uh, the, the tools. Um, so some, some, you know, good practice and, and, and shared resources, I think it could help in, in having a more standard environment where we work and we deploy and we run the project. Would that look something like sort of easier access to 
um, like things being hosted on a Code for America GitHub or AWS or like wherever it's hosted so that it doesn't end up stuck in, in people's personal accounts, stuff like that, or? Yeah, well, uh, in, in, in theory, <laughs> I envision uh, uh, a team or different teams of, of real experts across Code for America. And so I would love the existence of a DevOps team, um, as well as, you know, we can expand it in a, a team of very good database people or uh, very good React JS people. So it, it seems, you know, there are some a handful of technologies and, and assets, technical assets that uh, most of the projects use. Uh, I don't know that, you know, if there is enough um, helping each other, sharing information on how to use these tools. And, um, and, and so many times with the tools we have today, everything you know, deployed in the cloud, uh, scalability, it's, it's not a problem. And so it seems that you know, if Code for America had some centralized accounts, like I don't know if on Heroku or AWS, then if some team needs you know, an extra database, Barred, you know, the, 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 the accounting <laughs> and funding availability, but it should be quick and easy and not a concern, not a constraint on the project. Um, and also because sometimes uh, it seems that we don't have the, the typical two or three environments for each project. I, I used to work in a big company where we had a development environment a QA environment and then the production environment. Um, right now, you know, whichever environment people can find, and as I mentioned, sometimes under personal accounts, uh, tool it's deployed, and that's the only deployment. Um, totally. Does anybody else have any thoughts too? Thanks so much, Gio. That's great. Um, as far as magic wands go. Uh, I would love it. I think it would be really helpful for the network if there was some uh, like story journalist copywriter contracted to go out and interview interesting projects and you know turn that into long form written pieces. It happens a little bit, but I think we could use as much as we could get. Yeah, on the note of um, publicity and social media, I think so also I'm saying this having not worked on any of the projects and not really part of Code for America, just like attached in this way. Um, I think it's helpful to have that come alongside a project that you can tell is going to have a big impact because we were sort of playing catch up when we um, realized that we had this great thing that was doing um, functionality that didn't exist elsewhere and nobody knew about it. All right. Uh... I'll echo uh, Meredith's comment in the chat and, and double down by observing that you're not really part of Code for America with the exception of the direct and impactful way that you're, that you're definitely part of Code for America that you've presented today. Um, so I, I want to uh, uh, be mindful of time and, and move us on a little bit. I know, um, so I, I'm going to uh, give a quick announcement about next month, and I, I um, want to ask uh, Eli to, to give a, a quick um, description of a project that he's working on that is related to that. Um, so we are, um, as, as you know, this is a uh, this is sort of a, a new format that we're doing um, that I, I would like to continue um, doing. One of the uh, things that we're going to play with is doing uh, every every third one of these project standups will be themed and um, will be hosted by uh, someone from the Code for America program staff. So uh, next month, it is, uh, this event will be held on the 10th of March, uh, same time. And it'll be a criminal justice themed, um, themed stand up with, with projects in, in that area. And it'll be co-hosted um, by uh, David Crawford, one of, the, one of the program managers on our criminal justice team. So someone with much more subject matter experience than I have, um, but, uh, Eli, do you want to give us a, a, a quick pitch for the CourtBot project that you've been working on in Delaware as a little uh, little trailer for that event? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Will. Yeah, this will be a little preview for next uh, next month's event. Um, so, you know, kind of building off um, a lot of court bot work that's been done across the brigade network. Uh, last summer, we started uh, at, at Open Data, Open Data Delaware, we started a court bot iteration of our own. Um, and we are partnering, partnering with two local organizations, uh, one organization called Network Delaware, um, which is kind of a local uh, legislative issue campaign uh, organization, um, and also um, our local community uh, legal aid organization uh, to stand up CourtBot. Um, I'll get into more detail about the kind of uh, specifics of Delaware's um, uh, kind of legal system, uh, specifically as it relates to eviction. Um, our our CourtBot iteration is gonna uh, specifically target eviction uh, kind of in the COVID era, um, uh, there's kind of expected to be uh, a, a, a kind of a massive tide of, uh, of eviction filings uh, once uh, the moratorium, um, the national moratorium is lifted. And uh, it seems like that's uh, getting farther into the future, which obviously is, is a good thing. Uh, so at next month's um, uh, event, I'll kind of talk about the partnerships we've built, um, the scraper that Eric Truitt uh, has really spearheaded who's on the call. Um, he and I have, I've worked very, very closely uh, with another community partner, uh, another uh, colleague, uh, Abby Samuels, who's from Community Legal Aid. So uh, at next month's uh, event, I can kind of detail all of that and uh, hope you can join us. Uh, we are looking for a graphic designer uh, as we look to roll out our, 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 our iteration of CorpBot. So if anyone has any leads there, uh, that would be much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Eli. I, I am looking forward to that. And and a court bot, a, a court bot taken from one brigade installed in another place, focused on evictions during COVID is is really the nexus of a bunch of our priorities right now. So nice job hitting that bullseye. Um, well, thank you all very much for joining. I will post the notes um, from this on Slack. I'll also share a survey with you all um, to see how how you felt about this event and hopefully get some suggestions as we move forward. Like I said, this is um, a, a slight um, change of how we've been doing these in the past. And um, they're, they, they, there's no point in doing them if you're not having a good time at them. So please um, share with me how you felt about them and, and how they could be improved. Um, but with that, I will close it up and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you all. Good night. Great to see you.